You are now listening to the Serious Growth Podcast with your host, Leo Costa Jr. Welcome to SeriousGrowth.com. On the show today, we have a former professional boxer who competed from 1996 to 2010. He is the former WBO heavyweight champion of the world. His name is Layman Brewster. Layman, how are you today? Hey, man, how you doing, Leo? I'm doing pretty good. I, at the top of the show, I was telling you, I, I remember, man, back in those days, watching you in the ring to, to have you on, on, uh, on the show today is a real honor for me. I, I, I mean that. Um, it was fun to watch. Um, okay, so, Lamy, you were best known for, or known for um, the upset victory of uh, Vladimir Kuchko. Kuch- no, yep, Vladimir Kuchko, yep. It was yeah. uh, April 10th. Mandalay Bay, uh, HBO. Nice. Hey, who was your idol growing up? I'm sorry? Who was your idol growing up? Uh, well, that's a trick question. <laughs> because I, I looked at many fighters. I admired many fighters growing up and through the years it changed. Uh, but I would say, overall, it probably would have been Marvin Hagler. So oh, it was I Marvin remember. Hagler. Julio Cesar Chavez, yeah, Larry Holmes, um, yeah, Man, yeah. Those, those are the those names I've, I've forgotten top. about. Uh, so, so Hagler. Now, was he a left-handed fighter? No. Yeah. Well, so the thing about Hagler, Hagler could fight both ways, but he primarily fought southpaw. Okay, that's what I thought. And then, yeah, yeah. Would you say that sounds like over the years then that maybe you're you were influenced by all these people? But I I guess maybe I'm thinking about like my own career as I was going on and as I was evolving, I was influenced in in different ways by different people. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because you're always growing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, So how did you get into boxing to begin with? Uh, Well, so I was a big karate fan. I was a big uh, Kung Fu theater fan, so to speak. And I used to... um, really indulge into all the movies that they used to come on television, uh, the karate movies. And so I used to karate chop a lot of things. <laughs> and so one night my mother had some, some company over and like any child that, that wants to hang out in the room with all the adults, I got sent to my room when I was around seven. And um, I went into my room and I took my anger out on the a brand new drum set that my mother had just bought for me. And, uh, you know, after the company left, she came in and uh, she showed me her version of uh, Rodney, <laughs> which was crazy. <laughs> so the, the next day, the next day after I got out of school, when I came home, she said, we're going to do something to get rid of all this energy. We're going to take you down the street to a local community center called Riverside and here in Indianapolis, Indiana, where I originally grew up at. And so she took me to that gym. And when I walked into that gym, I smelled something that was electrifying to me. And it it it, it really tapped in into all my senses. Huh. And uh it was it was the the the, the smell and the and the scenery of 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 seeing men with their shirts off jumping rope, hitting the bags. I mean, men at work. And it, I just was really inspired by that, you know, because it made sense because of all the karate movies I watched and right. how these guys would practice and get better and win. And so I knew Bruce Lee liked karate. I mean, like boxing. They didn't offer karate at the community center, but I knew he liked boxing. And so I made it a point to try to become – the Bruce Lee of boxing, so to speak. <laughs> nice. That's funny. How old were you? I was seven. I was seven. seven. Okay. I was seven. So now, my other question was, what makes someone get into boxing? I mean, is there, like in, in your case, uh, you were taken out there by your, your mother to get yep. uh, to release some energy. But I'm, I'm going to guess, obviously, that, I mean, I couldn't imagine myself uh, getting into boxing. I know in high school... I put the gloves on one time at PE class, 
And all it took was getting hit in the head one time. And I thought, wait a minute, I'm going to go play football right and put a helmet on, you know? So what, what makes a guy want to get into the ring like that and get, you know, get punched out like that? Well, there's a thing in life that it, we, we say, uh, do what you do what you love and love what you do. Yeah. And so when it came to boxing, I was so much better than anybody my age. I was so much better than people close to my age that when, when it came time for me to graduate high school, my mother was like, she came to me, she said, I don't care what you do, just be the best at it. Yeah. And like, like any kid, I could have went to college, you know, um, I, I had scholarships to play uh, football in college. But my love for boxing was just so much greater because I was so much better than everybody else. Yeah. And so there was a guy by the name of John Long that used to play for the Indiana Pacers one time. He came to my school in the eighth grade. I went to Crispus Attucks High, uh, Crispus Attucks uh, Junior High. They changed it from a high school. Oscar Robinson went to that school, as a matter really? of fact. And so he was talking about how he became an uh, uh, NBA player. And he said he did it because like any young child, you're into all different sports and whatnot. But he said, as he continued to grow, he started narrowing down the particular sports that he was playing, trying to decide where he was going to put all his eggs in, in one basket. And when he got down to it, when he had let go of track and, football and everything else and really focused on basketball, it led him to become an NBA a basketball player. And I went to the auditorium that day not to hear that speech. I didn't know what he was going to talk about. They just came over to inter intercom and said, if anybody want to get out of class, you can go down to the auditorium and listen to a guest speaker. So I just went trying to be out of class, trying to get yeah. away from doing some work. Yeah, you but as he that. was continuing to speak, he said key words that just resonated with me. And what ended up happening was I, I was left with the impression on what success could be. Yeah. And so I tried to, the best of my ability to take this, this, this formula that he had, which was narrowing down his sports. What ended up happening was it made me such a better boxer. And I was already the best boxer in the city and then the state, and then the country, and then the world, because I decided to place all my faith in the fact that I believed that I could be a boxer, not because I wanted to hit somebody or because I wanted to be hit, but because in my heart, I knew I was better at hitting than getting hit, which is what the art and science of boxing is. Yeah. So I've always looked at boxing not from a physical standpoint, because anybody will tell you that knows boxing, boxing is mental. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I couldn't be a boxer, but you're fighting right now and in life. Every day you got to pay a bill. Every day you got to pay a mortgage. Every day you have to have the responsibility to do something. Every day that life comes at you, you're fighting. That's so what I've done was I have married the two so that it could help me to be successful in my life outside of the ring. And so that's the same mentality that I take with boxing. I don't want to punch anybody, but it's just like, I don't want to tell anybody no, yeah. you know? So I life and boxing are the exact same thing, except life is harder because unlike, unlike life, with life, you can't get up sometimes, you know, when you go down. But boxing, you can always take a knee or you yeah. get knocked down, you can get back up and fight again. So yeah. that that's kind of, how boxing resonates with me. You know, you said something uh, really important. My background is in uh, sports. Uh, well, one of my backgrounds is in sports specific training and conditioning. So it's being very specific to that particular person, whether it's a football player or baseball, whatever sport they're in, there's some, as you are pointing out, there's some very specific things that these athletes need to do. And here's, here's what I found where the mistake uh, was as far as, uh, what I was um, going through with uh, certain coaches is they were trying to, even though you need to at some, at some point start specializing, 
these coaches were making these kids and, and suggesting that these kids start specializing too early. And it's really important that when you're young, when you're first starting, because that sounded like you did the same thing, it's important to do all these other activities because it develops certain aspects of your physiology, right? Even your maturity. And when you Absolutely. when you specialize too soon, it actually has a um, uh, unintended consequences because you're not developing all these skills, right? So what, you're, what you actually did was exactly what needs to be done. My, my uh, oldest son ended up playing uh, professional baseball for the Kansas City Royals. Mm -hmm. and But he played soccer and all these other sports. But I'll tell you what, here's what I also learned. And I don't know how old you were with the boxing thing, but at the when he was a junior in high school, okay, we already knew as a freshman that he needed to start eliminating some of these other because he was a multi-sport athlete. Because we found out that in baseball, you had to be at your best your junior year because that's when the scouts come recruiting you. But I guess sure. the point that I'm making is that you did exactly the right thing to start specializing because you know what? Even though your body has an amazing ability to adapt to multiple environments, it doesn't do it in the most efficient way because it's compensating for all these other things that you're trying to do. Multitasking doesn't work. Right, you know? right. So that all you did was just break that thing down, and you became and totally focused on being a boxer. That was a I very mean, smart move, and uh, that you did that. Now, do you have to have a personality, a certain personality, to get into this type of sport? You um, no, you don't. Um, so, so here's the thing. Just like with life, our personality, it it shapes our path in life. It shapes our mentality. It shapes how people receive us, how we're perceived. So with some people, the happy-go-lucky attitude is the, is the mindset that they need because that's what, what makes them a more uh, successful uh, person in life. Some people need uh, the, the type of mentality as, as George Foreman took in his, in his younger days, which was always angry. Mike Tyson, always angry. You know, you look at a person like Evander Holyfield, always smiling, always, you know, he has a grin on his face. Muhammad Ali, always smiling, you know. So personalities just really dictate the type of style that a person has. Like, like an aggressive person, in life would be an aggressive person in the ring. A it. passive person in life would be a passive person in the ring. So all you're really doing is trying to marry the two. You're trying to use your paintbrushes with it, with which are all, which are your hands, and you're trying to express yourself according to your personality. If you understand what I'm saying, that that's really interesting because that's a, that's I've been uh, that's being real creative. You know, like you're an artist inside the inside the ring. And the the thing is. It's hard for me. It's kind of funny to think that somebody passive, which you just made a point of, that could be a somebody who could be in the ring as a boxer. I just didn't, you know, you made you just made me understand this in a in a completely different way. You're yes, sir. You're, you're an artist in the ring, basically. And according you're expressing to expressing yourself. Yeah. Based on it's all your, about expression. I it's like how that. you feel. It's how you feel that particular day. You know, uh some some days because you you know, boxing is a chess match. Boxing is, is, is two people who have agreed that they're going to beat each other physically using their mind. Nobody says I'm going to get into the ring and win because my muscles are bigger right. or because I'm stronger. I'm going to get in the ring and win because mentally I'm more dedicated. I, I just, I'm, I'm more determined. I am, I have figured out what your weaknesses are. I'm going to take advantage of your strengths. So, so, Boxing is a real mental sport. And, and here's, a, here's a point. Here's a case, and here's a point. Muhammad Ali, he wasn't physically bigger than uh, George Foreman. He wasn't physically stronger than George Foreman. But what he was, he was smarter. He yeah. was smart enough to figure out, if I look at this man fights in the past, he gets tired from punching himself out. If I can endure and take him into the deep water, then he'll drown himself because if you're swinging hard early, you won't be swinging hard later. 
Um, and and it takes a it takes a mindset of understanding to be able to accomplish that. And so once he saw the openings of a frustrated George Foreman, then he was able to show why he's the greatest of all times. And it wasn't because his muscles was bigger. It was because his mind was better. Yeah, that's a good point, you know, to be, and, and to think that you're able to do all that in the heat of, you know, gloves, you know, punching you, you know, that you're able to actually, you know, have that kind of control and that mindset. I guess at that point, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm comparing it to like football, but at some point, uh, as you get better at your craft, the game actually slows down and you're able to think inside of a ring where you're getting the hell beat out of you, you know, pretty much, Absolutely. you know, that's interesting, you know. Um, you, you smarter, not harder. Yeah, that's a good point there. So does boxing promote violence, do you think? No, it does not promote violence. What, what boxing promotes is confidence. What boxing does is it humbles a person because I've seen the toughest guys in the whole entire world out on the streets come into a boxing gym over the years and just get humbled because when they realize boxing is not about being tough. Boxing is an art form. Boxing is the ability to, it's, 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 it's the art of hitting without getting hit. It's the art of expressing yourself. And so what you find is a person who did have confidence in life. They can come into the gym and they can get confidence in life by hitting a bag because what it's, do, what it's doing is, is it's, promoting, it's, it's promoting a way that you feel about yourself. When you look around and you see everybody else hitting the bag and you're hitting the bag just as hard or just as good. I mean, when I was a kid and I used to see those older guys hitting the bag, oh my gosh, I just wanted to be able to hit the bag as good as them. Not that I wanted to be better than them or stronger than them, but once I got to that point where I could hit the bag as good as them, it made me more confident about myself walking outside of the gym. Not because, oh, well, I think I can beat somebody up, yeah. But because, you know what, I got enough confidence that if somebody messes with me, that's going to be the last thing they ever going to want to do because I've proven to myself by doing it. If nobody else was watching, just the fact that I was hitting this bag where when the bell first rings, because it's a three-minute it's a three minute uh, round, every round in boxing and professional or amateur boxing for, for males are three minutes. And so when the bell rings, the guy with the big muscles say, oh, yeah, I'm going to kill this bag. And he's throwing these big haymakers at the bag. He may be the greatest puncher for the first 15 or 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. But but after that, you still got another two minutes and 35, 40 seconds to, to go in the round. And what happens is that the, the guy who didn't have the biggest muscles, he already understood, I can't outpunch this guy because he's hitting the back harder than me next to me but guess what i'm gonna endure yeah. i'm gonna just endure to the end just like the bible says it says endure to the end yeah. and so when that little guy or that un uneducated guy is hitting that back hitting that back hitting that back and he looks over at the guy with the big muscles who's he's yeah. about to pass out and yeah. he's slapping the bag and holding the bag to help keep himself up but yet he's still over there just working 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 it does something to a person's psyche sure. from a spiritual, from a mental, and a physical standpoint. When a, when, a young, when a young man or woman sees that determination in the gym, it makes other people want to show, hey, I'm just as determined. Life yeah. has never been about who's the biggest or who's the strongest. Life is all about endurance and being smart. That's a good point. You know, you, it reminds me of what you're saying a little bit while flashing in my head because I was a big Muhammad Ali fan as well. I remember, uh, especially towards the end of his career, he used to do that rope-a-dope. And he would just, you know, as you know, he would just be up in that, and just let that guy punch himself out, right? That's what he did. Yep. You know, what a smart guy that was, right? Because he right. knew, I'm assuming he knew at that point, compared to earlier in his career, you know, he didn't have maybe, you know, the, the ability to do all that running around like he used to. But right. we use a different tactic. And what I didn't understand sometimes, Layman, is I'm I'm assuming the guys that he was fighting knew what he was doing, but he always seemed to bait them in, and they kind of fell for the same thing all the time. Am I wrong? No, you're absolutely <laughs> right. So he put them on his chessboard. 
Yeah. He put them in, he put them in his diagram. When when you're in somebody else's world, then you're on you only you can only do what they have given you. Yeah. You know, he didn't he didn't give them the jab and right hand to hit. He made them work. He made them go into the to the to the deep waters because and I and I took pages from his book. When I beat Vladimir Klitschko, for instance, it wasn't that I was bigger than Klitschko or stronger than Klitschko, and it doesn't matter if I could match him skill-wise, which I could. The point is, he had the reach on me, he had the height on me, and any man punching down can punch even stronger because gravity is working with him. But I knew, just like Muhammad Ali, pressure bust pipes. And if I can get a man to punch when he don't want to punch, hold when he don't want to hold, fight when he don't want to fight, then how long can he do that before he mentally implodes. Right. And so I just kept putting pressure, kept putting pressure, kept putting pressure, kept enduring everything that Muhammad Ali did, just enduring, enduring until I was able to see the the crack, right. the mental crack of my opponent. And yeah. so when he realized that his muscles couldn't beat me, it was too late because yeah. mentally I was already up on him. That's really interesting. Wow. That's a smart tactic. Yeah. And the thing about that is it sounds like what you've done, what you did and what Ali did was you took this, your fighter, that fighter out of his comfort zone. And then Absolutely. it was, you know, then he was all of a sudden in an area, again, I think you call it deep water where he's not used to being in, you know, and the tables yeah. have turned at that point. So Absolutely. Wow. Every, 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 I'm sorry. I was going to say everybody can fight when they're in their comfort zone. Everybody right. can't compete when they're in their comfort zone. But when you take a man and you say, well, we're not going to play checkers because that's what you win at all the time. Right. We're going to play chess. I'm going to make you wait. I'm going to I'm going to make you sacrifice. I'm going to make you think. Yeah. And if you can beat me then, then you deserve to yeah. win. Yeah. And that's what I tell people. Don't let nobody beat you because they're smarter than you. I mean, never let a man beat you or a woman or anybody in this world beat you because they're smarter than you. That just requires you having a conversation with yourself over and over again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, how long were you an amateur? I was in the amateurs from approximately 1980 till 1996. I turned professional at the end of 96. Uh, I was the U.S. Olympic team captain for the 96 Olympics. Leading up to the Olympics for two and a half, three years, I was number one in the United States as an amateur heavyweight, which is the 201 region uh, area. I won a silver medal in the Pan American Games. I won the U.S. Nationals twice. I won the Golden Gloves, uh, the State California Golden Gloves twice, the Indiana Golden Gloves twice. Um, I won multiple tournaments and awards. But at the end, when it really counted, I was going to a divorce. Oh. And that kept me out of the 96 Olympics, unfortunately. Yeah. So, well, yeah, but it's, it seems like you have to fight a lot of amateur fights before you turn pro then, or does, does it really? Do um, no, it's, it's not necessary to. It, it's not necessary. Like, you have people like Bernard Hopkins, who he came out of prison and, and became a multi-world champion. Uh, you have a lot of fighters who didn't have a, a, a tremendous amount of amateur fights, but the amateur is to give you the experience on so many different levels, mentally, spiritually, physically. Yeah. Walking out into a venue with a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand or a couple of million people, it can have an effect and should have an effect on your mind right. if you're not used to it. So right. amateur boxing is great because it gives you all different styles, all different heights, all different ways of 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 a person's understanding on what the sport is all about. And so the best thing that you can do is just hone your craft, right. like any sport or anything in life you want to do. If you do it enough, enough you'll master it, and then yeah. you can apply it to that. Uh, you know something that you know, what a lot of people don't realize is when somebody is doing something uh, that looks easy, they don't realize all that went into it prior to doing that. <laughs> You know, absolutely. Making something hard look easy is not something that just happens overnight. That's for sure. You know, and that's what you're saying. Uh, when you're fighting in the amateur ranks, do you do you have to wear headgear the whole time? Yes, we 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 do wear headgear. Well, at least we did then. I'm kind of hearing that the rules have changed in certain regions of the of the country or the world, which I don't understand because 
a, a guy fighting with a headgear is one of the best things that can happen to him as an amateur because it 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 limits his his um his chances of getting cut or elbowed uh, or like knocked out. If you get knocked out, at least the the padding in the back of the the the, the headgear will help to cushion the blow so you don't, you know, you don't get the, the brain damage. Uh, so, you know, I I have heard that they are removing that from amateur boxing, which I think is stupid because the kid suffers a nasty cut as an amateur, that's going to pretty much uh, do away with his professional Yeah, chance. because he's always susceptible yeah. to cuts then, right? Mm-hmm. And plus, mm-hmm. I even think this is important, like I think in your, you're mentioning it, is the, the brain trauma, you know, because that's, some, yeah. that can have lifelong effects. You know, Absolutely. If you get cut, you know, you can cut, you know, you might not be in the ring very long, but you could probably go on in your life and be okay. But man, if you have some brain trauma, I mean, this is, this is something that's going on with uh, American football. Now they're dealing with, you know, and this yeah. is serious stuff. I agree with you. I think they should keep the, the padding on end of story until they turn pro, you know, I yeah. do too. Yeah. Um, I do too. And I, th- I think, I think also another thing that we must start to look at because you you've had more debts in boxing here as of lately. Mm-hmm. And, and I kind of contributed to maybe the, 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 the material that they're using in terms of with the gloves. See in the, in the olden in the olden days, they used to use horsehair, which was something that was a lie. Mm-hmm. Now they use foam. And so that could be one of the things that is attributing to the damage that these fighters are taking um, today, so, you know, which is, is always sad when you hear about somebody yeah. dying. So, are you saying that foam is more dangerous than the, than the uh, horsehair, or vice versa? Uh, well, I put it like this: all the fighters that that we knew and loved growing up, man, um, all the way up until sometime in the either early '90s or late '80s, they they fought with horsehair gloves. Uh-huh. Uh, in their gloves, horsehair. But today they have foam. Foam is not alive. Horsehair is alive. <laughs> and so I don't know. I'm just saying maybe, maybe, maybe it's making a difference because you, I'm seeing more injuries now with these fighters than in, at a, at a different time. And then also the hand wraps that they use. You know, who's to say that the galls, the material? Yeah, it may be cotton, but the just the the, the density of the cotton. Yeah. along with these foam gloves hitting people, could be making a difference. I mean, we have to weigh all options. And that ain't to say that, oh, that's the reason. But, you know, I don't want to see anybody else die in any sport, especially not boxing. Well, and I think based on what you're saying, that's worth looking at, for goodness sake. I mean, there's a reason that it's happening, you know. Um, so who knows? It could be that. I mean, it's just like in uh, in football. You know, they, they have these helmets that are, are a lot – a lot more uh, padded up now and they're higher technology. And I almost think that it's caused a, an unintended consequence because guys are using it more as a weapon and where you didn't have all that padding. Guess what? You're not going to do that. You know? So maybe in some ways that's what you're talking about. Who knows? You know? Um, So what was your breakthrough moment in boxing? Would you say you probably had more than one, but what was the one that you kind of, or one or two that you remember? (laughs) Well, so there are a plethora for me. Um, breakthrough moment. I graduated high school. We have family unions every single year uh, around the United States. And this particular year was in my my home, my hometown of Indianapolis, Indiana. And I had just graduated high school. And it was, I was going over to my my auntie's house for the celebration, the, the, the uh, firm reunion. And I brought some of my friends with me. And I was like, come on, man, I know we can go eat. <laughs> and so I say, we're going to go eat. And as I was walking up after I had parked with my friends and we're walking to the table to go get something to eat, I hear it to the left of me, out of my peripheral vision, in my peripheral vision, my cousin was saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. I need somebody to help me to drive back to California. She had just driven. She had flown my cousin who was in college out to Los Angeles to help her to drive back to the family reunion. And she had her three little children with her. And 
you know, and so my, I don't know how, next thing I know, I just interrupted, I'll help. And now I'm on my way to go eat. I ain't thinking about right. driving, I ain't thinking about California, I ain't thinking about nothing. But next thing I know, I'm like, what, what did you say? Like, okay. So the next thing, I'm driving to Los Angeles with three children and I'm listening to Sesame Street the entire time for three days. <laughs> when I see Big Bird, I'm knocking him out. <laughs> but but when I got to California, I ran into people like Oscar De La Hoya. Oh, man. Um, uh, another 92 Olympian, Montel Griffin. Oh, uh, another man. mentor named Larry DeShado Musgrove. Uh, met Jesse Reed. Uh, Oscar De La Hoya. So, so when I got out there... I just, I, I was supposed to drive out there and help fly back. I, I mean, I was supposed to help her to drive out there and then fly back. Yeah. But I said, you know, I just graduated high school. I won everything in the Midwest. I'm going to take my boxing gear and I'm going to uh, just try to maybe go to a gym or so, just see what the competition is out yeah. there. So when I got out there, a lawyer by the name of Mitch Stein, he said, hey, if you're ever in Los Angeles, look me up. So I said, man, let me get this guy a call, let him know I'm coming out. Came out, he ended up having a friend of his named Chuck Walker take me all around all of Los Angeles visiting all these boxing gyms. Everybody really liked me, and they just kept telling me to go to different gyms. And then I, I ran into uh, Jesse Reed. He liked me. He spoke to the, the attorney about me, and he thought I was really good and could have a good, a bright future if I stayed with it. So. This was uh, 91, and I ended up getting an apartment in uh, Orange County, Huntington Beach. And I went to uh, Westminster Boxing Gym, and um, I honed my skills, and I got to be around other um, fighters that were trying to be successful amateurs and professionals. And, you know, the Bible says that iron sharpens iron and man sharpens man. And just being around these guys, they helped me to get so much better than I already was. And before I knew it, I ended up making a U.S. Olympic team. So that brought me to the next wow factor. The next wow factor is being 18 years old. I'm in California and I got I got asked to go to Tahiti to fight in Tahiti against the Tahiti champion. And next thing I know. I'm on a plane getting off on the on the tarmac and I'm eating sushi for the first time <laughs> with, with the locals, man. And they giving me black pearls and I'm standing on an inactive volcano. I'm standing under a waterfall of fresh water that I'm actually putting in my mouth in Tahiti. Like I thought I would one day get to visit Mexico or maybe <laughs> Canada, next time I'm in Detroit, I had no idea that I was going to be able to go to a place called Tahiti that, you know, like people only dream of, like we're talking about a, a young inner city kid from Indianapolis, Indiana, that nobody even know to have boxing in the state, let alone to become a heavyweight world champion, which I became the first. <laughs> yeah, and, and check this out. It's all because of a random act. You know, because of random act, random act and, and, you just never know. Like, that's a good life lesson. You just don't know, you know, absolutely. that next that next door that you open where it takes you. What an amazing, amazing story. So, uh, who were some of the other uh, pros you fought? Oh wow! So, I sparred with people like Lennox Lewis, James Lysout, Tony, yeah, Michael Moore, Michael Dokes. I sparred with so many world champions over the years that, that were that were famous in their day and held multiple titles, man. Um, it was just all a, a growing and learning experience that helped to make me the person that I am and the fighter that I am. My trainer, by the way, his name was Bill Slayton. He trained Ken Norton. Ken Norton beat, uh, as you know, Muhammad Ali. Yeah. And, uh, he Ken Norton was his first world heavyweight champion, and I was his last world heavyweight champion. He passed away 
in 2003, but he had already set the blueprint in me yeah. to win the title, which I won in 2004 by defeating Vladimir Klitschko. Yeah. So when you say you sparred now, does that mean that these guys that you were sparring, were they still in the middle of their careers? Or are they somebody that, I mean, yes. because yes. really, yes. And they would try to knock you out any chance <laughs> they could. <laughs> so, so they were warming up on you at that time. Is that right? We're, Hey, they were trying to. So the thing that always saved me in boxing was that I never looked at boxing as a sport. I, it, it was never a sport for me. Mm -hmm. You don't play boxing. You play yeah. basketball. You play football. You don't play boxing. Yeah. And so Bruce Lee, he is somebody who I have tried to, I guess, he was, I could say he was my philosopher. You know, his philosophy, I've studied all his books, his writings, his teachings. I I actually took martial arts to help me with footwork, to help me to understand what life is about and understand that boxing is an art, an art form. It's the, it's the ability to hit without getting hit. My first trainer was a gentleman by the name of Honey Boy Bill Brown. He used to hobo back in the day with Jack Dempsey when they used to, tie uh, ropes around trees. He was a bare knuckle fighter out of Louisville, Kentucky. He had uh, 330 bare knuckle fights. He was a middleweight bare knuckle champion. And he, he always taught me what boxing was. It was never about hitting. It was the art of hitting without getting hit. Anybody can hit. Stevie Wonder can hit. Ray Charles can hit. Anybody blind can hit. But any man with eyes cannot block, yeah. cannot slip, cannot roll, cannot not get hit. So right. the art is the ability to hit without getting hit. And that is who is deemed the winner, not the person who throws the most punches, not the person who's in the best shape, but the person who gets hit the least that yeah. throws the most punches. I like that perspective. That's an interesting, uh, you know, because I've never looked at it from that uh, point of view, but that's interesting. What was your worst defeat in the ring? Uh, so my worst defeat in the ring was a fight against a gentleman. Uh, his name was the Nordic Nightmare. It was my last fight. Uh, it was back in 2010. It was over in Germany, two hours outside of uh, Checkpoint, Checkpoint Charlie, outside of Berlin in the country. And they wanted to make a big name off of a big name fighter. And they used me. And they so they gave this guy... Uh, a room to, to get changed in. And the rule in boxing is you don't wrap your hands too early before a fight because if you do it, it gets soggy. Your hand wraps. But he had wrapped his hands three hours before the fight and kept the door shut the whole time. And then they told me they were using the Austria rules, which is there is no glove, no glove inspection. And in my entire life, since I was seven years old, I've never not had a glove inspection in no country I went into. Oh. So this guy, we come out because when they said there was no glove inspection, I'm saying, listen, man, I'm a former heavyweight champion of the world, dude. Like, this is not heard of. And they threatened me that if I didn't fight, they were going to do this and do that and do that. And I'm saying, listen, man, you don't know who I am. <laughs> I'm not. I, 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 I fight. Because I'm a warrior, first and foremost. And I fear no man but God. Trust and believe. And so I took the fight. But in the fight, he, I ain't going to say he, I'm going to say they. Because that morning, my phone rang early in my hotel room. My wife answered the phone. And I just looked at her as she picked up the phone. And she had this weird look on her face. And she put the phone back down. And I just knew, look, it's the day of the fight. Don't even ask. I don't even want to know what it was. Right. You know. And so she hung up the phone. And so I get into the fight with the gentleman. And I notice the, the opening of every round, the first shot he threw it was like he had a, a, a white powder substance on his, on his glove or something. And I would go temporarily blind for, I would say, somewhere between it, it must have been between 10 to 30 seconds. Like, like I, I just couldn't understand it. And then when he threw punches, the punches he threw were so hard. I mean, man, I've been in boxing since I was seven years old. 
And this guy is throwing punches like, like he has a a a, a, a sledgehammer in his hands. Yeah. I looked at his record. He went the distance with half the people he fought, but every time he throws a punch, it feels like I'm getting hit with a hammer or something really, really hard. So uh, he ended up hitting me like, you're, so you're not supposed to hit behind the back, okay? This guy kept hitting me like in my kidneys, man. Like just in the ref would never say anything to this guy. But every time I made a move close to him, the ref called me for something. But to make a long story short, we got into the, la- the, the, the later rounds and he threw something and whatever he had in his glove was so hard that it hit me in right smack in my eye, and it 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 cut my iris and my and my my uh, cornea, and it made my eye uh, fuse together. So I lost the vision in, in my left eye as a result of it. And so after I got out the ring, because the fight had to be stopped because I was in so much pain. After the the fight was over, I went and looked in the mirror because I'm like something don't feel right. Now you know. In boxing matches, all the matches you've seen, we always cut on the bra of our eye, which, you know, that's normal to get cut because you have sharp ridges there. But I didn't have cuts on the, on the ridges of my eye. I had slashes across my eyelids like, like if I had an X-Acto knife and I was just slitting yeah. my, you know. And and so when I... When I got back home, I went immediately to my doctor in uh, Beverly Hills, Dr. Uh, Robert Carnes, and he's a fight doctor. He used to do the fights at the at the Olympic at, at the Olympic, uh, not the Olympic, the um, what a, what a, where the uh, Lakers used to play at the Forum, the yeah. Great Western Forum, and he did that for many many years. He said, in all my years of boxing since the '60s, he said I've never seen these kind of cuts in boxing. They're inconclusive with boxing. So then, you know, I talked to my my attorneys and they said that they couldn't do anything because it happened in Germany. I would have to get on a plane and I would have to go fly to Germany and I would have to get a German lawyer to sue the largest German company uh, boxing promotion in Germany. So to make a long story short, that was the worst fight because he cheated and I I can prove that he cheated. And and it's funny because even last year I ran into some guys that are also promoters uh, from Germany that was over. And they said the exact same thing. They knew what was happening, but of course they all stick together. Yeah. And so this guy, he 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 took my vision away. I, I no longer have the vision in my left eye as a result of it. So I would say that is probably the worst thing that happened to me. But here's the thing, in life, for all things that are good, bad comes about. For all things that are bad, good things come about yeah. because it's 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 helped me to focus more so on what God has for my life. And I say because I read so much of the Bible, it's better for a man to go to hell with with, with both eyes. No, so it's better to go to heaven with one eye than to go to hell with two eyes. <laughs> and and so you know, and the reason why I say that is because with success comes temptation. Comes temptation. I'm a young man. I'm successful. I'm in Los Angeles. And who knows where that success could have led me uh, down the wrong path. It, you know, you just never know. That's but with my eye, it's made me focus more on what I want to give back to this world, which is giving back to the kids and being able to help motivate people to be champions in life, but teaching them through boxing. So I've developed a program called Brewster's Place, which is Brewster's Dot Place. Um, um, yeah, it's Brewster's.place, www.brewster's.place, um, where I'm teaching life affirmations because everything about life is a fight. And everything about fight, I can show you how it equates to life. So right. now you got young men and young women who don't have mothers, who don't have fathers, but they have these affirmations that you need to look at life because life don't come at you straight. It comes at you as a hook. Life comes at you straight sometimes. You got to learn how to block. You got to learn how to roll. You got to learn how to catch. You got to learn how to endure. Sometimes life knocks you down. So everything that life has to offer, I put it to words, and I I have made an exact replica, a formula of how a person does it in the ring. So now they learn boxing in the ring. When they're in life, 
and somebody confronts them or there's a problem that they have to endure or something that knocks them, takes their breath out of them. Now they can look at it like a fight because yeah. life is a fight. It's a good life lesson. You know, that's a, it's a smart thing to do. Um, now, when you were, um, when you had uh, fought this guy, the Nightmare Nordic, is that the, the yeah. Nordic Nightmare? That's the name? Yep. So whereabouts were you in your career at that point? Because when you said you lost your vision, I'm assuming, did you continue to fight on even with a vision impairment like that? Yeah, yes, I did. Yes, I did. And the reason why I fought on is because I'm a warrior at the end of the day. And this is all I knew. I didn't know anything else other than fighting because I got my PhD in the art of knocking people out. I mean, just putting it plain. I've been I've been perfecting my my craft as a fighter since I was seven years old. Yeah. And so if you've only done one thing since you were seven, there's no way in this world you're going to turn around and pick up the next day and, and move happily forward with something else. So it was God that had to close that door in my life. And he knew taking my sight was the one thing that was going to make me quit fighting because I would have fought with a broke leg, a broke finger, a broke eye. I would have did anything. But when you take a virgin vision and the law say you can only fight if you have this amount of vision, well, now my focus is on trying to bring about other champions in the world versus boxing. So my program is not geared toward teaching people how to fight in the ring, but teaching them how to fight in life through boxing. But you said that you continued boxing even after that fight, or no? I did. No, oh. so that was the last That was the last sanctioned bout that I've had. Okay. That was the last fight that I've ever had inside of a ring with the referee and judges. Now, I spar. I spar because it, it, it keeps me alive. It allows me to get rid of my stress. It allows me to, to just whatever I feel about the world, I can leave it in the ring. Right. So I, I spar with people because, you know, it is the thing that, that led me from the, the constraints of, of my, my environment. So I keep my knife sharp. I keep my blade sharp because now I teach other people the art of punching the 108 pressure points and the 36 that'll kill you. I teach people about the footwork. I teach people about fear. I teach people about expressing themselves because boxing is only the art of expression and no more, no less. Yeah. Um, so what, you know, and the thing about that is, is that's how you uh, make yourself relatives. Kind of like me now, you know, I was in the bodybuilding industry for a long time. I competed for 15 years or so. And I asked myself at some point, I said, how can, how am I going to stay relative? Because like you, I am, I have as much love for my sport now as I did, if not more, as I did when I first started. And it's, it's a sad thing. Uh, it made me feel, you know, kind of sad when I thought, well, you know, how do I contribute now? Is it over for me? You know, but what I learned, I think it's what you're saying. I have all this knowledge and information now that I can pass it forward and uh, teach other people. So, you know, I, I'm just as alive in the sport as I was back then. In fact, I just came back from a big comp uh, bodybuilding competition. And, uh, man, that feels good, you know, all that that buzz inside. And, and yet, honestly, I, I'm not interested in having to put my body through that to get up on stage anymore. I don't want to do that. But sure. I, want, I want to be a part of it. And this is what I think what you're saying. You can still be relative in something that you love. What, what better thing is that? You know, say that, say that last part again. What better thing is that to be able to still be doing something that you love and have, you know, zest for life to, to do this on an everyday basis? It can't get better than that, can it? You're absolutely right. It does not get any better than that because we're what you consider as today, OGs, original yeah. gangsters, the people who did it for the love of it. Now, today... I can't say that people do it for the same reasons why I did it. I know when I walked in a boxing gym, I did it because I wanted to say I was heavyweight champion of the world. I never got into boxing to make money. I never got into boxing to be famous. I just wanted to say that I was heavyweight champion of the world. And I'll tell you a quick story about it, man. I prayed to God so much in my life from the age of seven until I won the world heavyweight title that even eight months after winning the title, on my knees, I'd have to stop myself in the middle of a prayer 
to not ask black, not ask God to allow me to be heavyweight champion of the world because I was heavyweight champion of the world. Yeah, you did that repetition for a long time. It's hard to break that kind of a, uh, you know, discipline when you've done that almost all your life like that. You know, that's funny. Um, well, you know, rep- what do you say? Repetition makes habit. The more you do something, the less you got to think to do it. That's right. And, and that's that's why people like yourself and people like me and others have have tasted. What, what success is and victory because we were not lazy about um, putting in that, that, that effort, that repetition that you need to, to know your craft, to be the, you know, it's not enough to just know something. It's when you know it from the inside and out. You got That's that when right. you're the master you of You got it. that right. You know, in my gym I, on the wall, I have repetition is a mother of skill. And you just said that. You know, and you're right about that. And that's the thing that's missing a lot of times because you and I know this, you know, your game. I know my game to the nth degree, every minute little thing I know. And I'll tell you what, I'm still learning. I start it every day. I'm always learning. I never stop learning. You know, Hey, you know what I have to, I have to tell you, man, I train at, at goals gym, uh, down, down, down in Venice beach, man. Or I try. I train with uh, Willie Goat, who used to be my first boxing manager. He played for the Chicago Bears. He was a famous running, running uh, wide receiver when uh, they had uh, uh, you know the who was it the, the was it the eighty four Bear, Bears the oh, Chicago yeah. and, um, they went all the way yeah yeah, yeah. refrigerator Perry and those oh, guys. But the, yeah. the point is, he took me to Gold's Gym every five days a week, and I would be in there. I just, See Flex Willer, I man, I've seen Lou Ferringo, oh, yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger. I've seen all those guys, man. Yeah, yeah. But just to see the the dedication that those guys would put into being there every single day. Yep. I mean, eating the dirty rice, man. The, the, <laughs> yeah. Eating the type of foods that I would look at them and be like, "Look, man, I'm going to In and Out Burger after my fight." <laughs> but just to see that dedication that those guys have, man, I have the utmost respect for weightlifters because. It's truly an art. It's truly an yep. art. I mean, all the way down to the pose, oh, to man. the preparation, to the rest, to the mindset, to the determination, and everything that you guys give up in life to be successful just for that short amount of time when you're standing on that stage, man. It's an incredible thing. It was a day. You know, I was in, in, like I said, I played sports, three, four, an athlete, I'll, you know, throughout my career. Nothing prepared me for life any better than being in the sport about bodybuilding because of what you said, because it took hours and hours and you had to be willing to walk in the fire every time you went into the gym. It wasn't exactly. easy training. It was like you put yourself in pain every time you went in and you had to be willing to do that on a, Just every like a fighter. Yeah. Everyday basis. You got to go in and do the work, you know? And I see it. Oh man. You know what? You know what, man? I'm about to fuss at you guys too, man. I'm, I'm generalizing here, by the yeah. way. So I'm in Go's gym one night and uh I'm 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 doing legs, man, and I'm sitting down and you said when you push up on the yeah. weights, leg you press. Put more, you know what I'm talking about? The leg press. Yeah. So some bodybuilder, he comes over next to me, he put on some weights, he put on the same amount as me. And so, you know, I, I guess my ego kicked in. Obviously, his ego kicked in. And so without us speaking to each other or really looking at each other directly, just out the corner of our eye, like, he ain't gonna lift more than me. He ain't gonna lift more than me. He ain't gonna lift more. So man, we sat there for about 30 minutes, stacking weights on between the two of us. And I don't even remember who won. The point that I'm getting at, because of that, I I got a sciatic nerve problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, a leg press, the leg, that leg press. Man, <laughs> and, and it makes it worse because a girl, like the, the pretty girls will walk by and you forget about the pain. Yeah. And so you got to put more weight on. <laughs> of course. You know, when I was in, uh, when I was in Bulgaria uh, talking about that pretty girl, I asked the coach and I said, you know, what's the best way to get, to get your, this is a Olympic lifters at the time. I said, Hey, what's the best way to get your athletes strong? He said, have a pretty girl walk in the room when they're lifting he, I cracked up. I go, what? Oh. A lot of truth to that. That totally taps Listen, into the male ego, right? I don't care how tired I used to be <laughs> in the gym. See, I'm, I'm tell you, a guy by the name of Charles Glass used to train. I know, me. I know Charles Glass. Man, 
that guy is amazing. Yeah. And, and then every time a girl would walk by and I'd be straining and I just get strong all of a sudden, you yeah, know? I, like, no, I get that. That is too funny. Uh, I, I want to I ask you, this is kind of coming from my background. Uh, when you, did you ever do any specific uh, weight training for your sport or nutrition? Was that, has that ever gotten uh, big in the sport? And did you do that? Absolutely, man. Weight, yeah. weight training and nutrition is part of the, the puzzle that you need to have a complete puzzle, to have a whole puzzle. It, the nutrition, the weight training, the sleep, the, the meditation, the boxing gym, the martial arts, the walking on the beach, the stretching, everything is a, is a piece yeah. of a puzzle. And when you can put all those pieces in the right place, then you can pretty much almost ensure success. Yeah. And so I just like when we were talking a minute ago about lifting weights, uh, I always wanted to have in my mindset because of Willie Goat that I was going to be the best on the field, or should I say in this case, the best in the ring. Because one thing he always made clear to me as an athlete, when he walked, when he walked out on that field as a receiver, he wanted to always know in his mind that he was better in better shape than his opponent. Yeah. And through his just his persistence and his 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 just repetition, he would always wear down his opponents because they didn't train after practice yeah. or they, when, when, when they left, when they left training, they left training, but I took it to the degree that he did. When I left the gym, I was still training. Yep. I mean, everything I did was always in preparation to become the best fighter I could. And when I was in the weight gym, when I thought that my opponent may have only been doing three or four sets I was trying to do six or seven sets. Yeah. When I thought he was only doing 250 in benches, well, I did 275. I just needed for my own confidence, I needed to know that when I got in that ring, that my opponent could not beat me because he didn't train as hard as me. He didn't train longer than me. Right. He didn't sacrifice. He didn't go to sleep at the times. He he ate foods that he shouldn't have ate. He did things he should. He went out partying. He went out drinking. I did everything that I was supposed to do. So what I did was when I got in the ring, the door of anything that was negative that could go through my mind was shut off. Yeah. It was left outside the ring. When I'm in the ring, I ran, I slept, I ate. I lifted, I didn't have sex, I trained, I sparred, I endured, I did everything. Yeah. So what excuse do I have to lose? That's right. I'm yeah. not going to lose. Only well, person I, can beat me is myself. That's right. And you know, the thing about that is in sport, it's really interesting as you're, <clears throat> excuse me, as you're going up the rank, when you get to the pro level where you're at, your weaknesses will, will be exposed if you haven't covered those bases. And that's what you're saying. It happens all the time. When you see a guy that, like in baseball, go up to the big leagues, and that, that pitcher will sniff out what his weak points are. And if he can't hit a ball that's a curveball, guess what? That guy's going to get a heavy dose of curveballs until he fixes that weakness, right? And Absolutely. That, and what you're saying is you just covered all the bases because – you know, at, at that point, it's like there's nothing else I could have done. I've done the, everything. I've covered every base. So the only person, like you said, that's going to beat me is me. What a what a positive uh, confidence builder that is. You know, and that doesn't mean that you're not going to get beaten uh, right. because when you're at that game, you can get beaten at any you know any day. It just happens to be that particular day he was or she was better. That's all. You know, and, you and that's know that. exactly. And that's exactly right. You know, uh, in one of the philosophies that Bruce Lee had, it was that there's no opponent. There's only images of the things that you fear about yourself that you're facing. Wow. That's pretty deep. That's deep, man. It really is. And it's, it's a really good way to look at it. You know, I even tell my some of the, the, the competitors that I work with, you know, and we talk about doing all this to the nth degree. And I try to I try to to give them a picture of what that really because there's a lot of people that want to be, you know, they like the idea of it. My job as a coach in this case, like you're a coach now and a mentor, that kind of thing. Is right. like, here's what really goes on. Here's you have to really wrap your head around this 
because most people like the idea of being there. They don't realize the journey that you will have to go through, you know, to get to that point. And I guess it's good because that way it's only, you know, the, it's, it's a few that end up being there, you know, and not just anybody, you know, that would not be the same. Um, interesting. Layman, you, you've been a, a really, uh, this has been a really fun interview, man. You've given me so much insight that I never knew about boxing. Um, so at this stage of the game, then, now we know that you have this uh, program that you're doing for the kids. Is there anything else that you're doing to, uh, I assume, to advance the sport? Because that's essentially what you're doing. You're helping people, but you're also, I'm assuming, you're advancing the sport uh, in some way. So what are you well, doing? Yes. So, so what I'm, what I'm, what I am doing is I am, I have created uh, a model, if you will, a formula of success. Um, like we say, we can prepare all we want, but if it ain't in God's card, sometimes we don't get that victory. Yeah. But it's never a loss unless you quit. Right. See, losing is not a loss. There's a difference. Losing means. I can come back and do it better. Yeah. Quitting means I no longer want to get better. Right. So it's everything that's negative about our life that we've used to make us better in life. And so what I've done is I formatted that understanding to Brewster's place because Brewster's place is not about a boxer. It's about teaching life skills through, through athletics. Yeah. My program is is open to any man or any woman that can teach life as they know it through their particular sport. Yeah. Because everybody in life wants to be successful. You'll never meet somebody, anybody in life that will say, I, I don't want to be successful. Even if it's just being average, I want to be successful being average. Right. You know, so, so the thing is, we always need that 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 guidance that yeah. help and yeah. and if this world if we focus more on trying to really help each other without the mindset of oh it comes with money see right. if you focus on what true success is money always follows right. it don't matter what you do in life if you're successful at what you do you'll make money somebody right. figure that out where you they say you know what if i get enough plastic and put water in it, I'll make money from it. Yeah. Not, oh, hey, buy this, give me money because I can put water in a bottle. Right. So success is anything that you have a passion for, there you, you know, because there's all degrees of what we consider success. So I have packaged that for fighting um, for, for uh, Brewster's Place because Bruce's place is something that we need in this country. We need men and women to say, listen, I am my brother's keeper. Because at the end of the day, we're, we have to turn this world over to, to people that are younger than us. Don't you want them to know what you know? Don't you want them to think the way you think? Don't you want them to feel the way you feel? Don't you want them to see the way you see? Because these are the people they're going to make the decisions on our lives because there's going to be a point where we're not going to be, be mentally, emotionally, or even physically in a position to do what we're doing right now. Right. So my thought is, look, Bruce's place is about family and unity. It's not a business. It's not about money. The money follows the success, the success of trying to make sure that these people, these kids, these adults can have that feeling that, listen, by myself, I can't make it to the moon. I can't make it to space, but I got a rocket booster called success. I got an, another rocket booster called determination. I got another rocket booster. I got somebody. So if everybody plays a part in, in launching our youth into doing greater things, then we'll always exist yeah. because it's the things that we do in this world that we're trying to, that we should be passing on to our youth. Because one day I want somebody to stop and help my son, help my daughter, help my wife. If I'm not here, 
because that's the right thing to do. That's the right way to think. But if nobody ever takes the time to say that's the right thing to do, to show them the right thing to do, well, then the Bible says, how can the blind lead the blind lest they both fall in a ditch? Yeah, I love your energy, <laughs> man. It's uh, You're uh, very contagious, I must tell you. Very motivational. Hey, listen, um, you don't live in L.A. now, do you? I don't, man. My goal is to come back to Indi- um, come back to Los Angeles. I, I was, I was living in Woodland Hills, man, and I stopped at a light. It was all by myself about seven years ago, and something said, "Go home." Yeah. The last thing I ever wanted to do was come back to Indianapolis because after you've lived in Los Angeles and you've been around the world, and you've met all the the beautiful people that I've met and, and all the hills that I've ran in and walked through and the horse trails and the ocean and everything that makes Los Angeles, Los Angeles. There's no other place on this earth I would ever want to live. Yeah, it's but, an amazing place. But when God, when God moved through me, it ain't like I heard a voice or nothing. Right. Something just felt like it said, go home. Yeah. I don't know why. My career was over. I said, you know what? Okay. I'm going to do that. Yeah. And so I went home and I've been helping these kids ever since. Beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. Hey, um, um, if you would, I would love to meet you in person someday. And uh, yes, LA, LA is only about a uh, 200 miles away. I, I lived in Venice and when I was bodybuilding, I lived down there in the hotel while I was doing, I was living the bodybuilding lifestyle. So I'm really familiar. Everything you're saying, I, I totally relate to. Okay. But, I would like to meet you someday and please shake your hand. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that this has been really amazing. I'm really proud of you, man. Um, that you you continue to do great things. I, I really am. And uh, maybe someday we can do another podcast. I would love that, man. I mean, you know, you're my brother and, and, and in my life, I want everybody that I know in my life to be proud of me according to, the work that I, I do. Yep. See, I, my, my goal is if I can get everybody to try to think about a legacy for themselves. When you leave this earth, what do you want people to re- remember about you, man? Yeah. So for me, what I want to be remembered for is that I try to love as many people as I could. And I try to make this world a better place. I mean, look, I don't have to look for the negativity in life. It's there. Yeah. But when I look at the sky at night, I'm not looking for the darkness. I'm looking for the stars, and that's what I'm trying to focus on. And if I can just help one person or two people or three people to, to look at the sky for what's in it and not the mass of it, then I think we'll find that beauty in life that draws us and pulls us in the right direction all the time, man. That's just what I think. Well, I feel you. I, I really do. I mean, you're, you have an amazing energy. So anyway, listen, we'll... Wrap this baby up. Uh, is there any? Uh, do you want to tell the the uh, our viewers where they can find your your uh, uh, what your, your you had something at the beginning of the show? But you want to say it again so they can know. Yes, thank you so much. So it's called Brewster's Place, and and the the website is www.brewsters.place. So Brewsters with an S, B R E W S T E R dot place, P L A C E. And just see what I'm trying to do, man. I, I raise money for Puerto Rico. Uh, I, I try to do as much as I can. Um, I can't do it alone. I need help. I just, we're a family, man. Yeah. We're, we're a family. And if you know anything about God, he said, I ain't going to, he didn't say I'm going to judge you because you're good or bad. He said, I'm going to judge you for your deeds. Your deeds are what you've done. You're yeah. going to stand for what you've done in your life. And what I want to stand for is to say, I tried to love this person. I tried to love this. I tried to do this. I tried to do that. Please let me in them gates. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think, I think uh, mission accomplished, man. <laughs> Listen, uh, uh, again, uh, if you're ever out to uh, L.A., we have each other's numbers. And yes, uh, please let me know. I'd like to come meet you. And vice versa, man. Vice versa. You okay, man? Listen. You that you the you the man. I mean, you that dude. Should I say, man? And 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 I I have been looking into to who you are, man. You got it going on. When I grow up, I want to be like you, man. Uh, so we have something in common. <laughs> All right, Layman.
We'll talk soon yes, again, okay? Well, God bless, man. Thank uh, you. Anytime you need me, I got you, big dog. Okay, man. <laughs> okay, take care. All right, baby. See ya. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye.